Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. As we begin, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. I'm Marcia Nelson. I'm an executive fellow at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. So thanks for joining us. I was really pleased to be asked to moderate this series of, of webinars on the Canadian Northern Quarter concept. <clears throat> the School of Public Policy has been undertaking research on the potential for this ambitious national project. And I think this series will allow us to learn uh, something of their work. We'll be taking audience questions after the presentation. So please click on the Q&A icon to submit your questions as they come to mind. And I'll do my best to make sure we, we get to as many as we can. To start off the series, we've got a group of experts from the School of Public Policy who are going to give us a sense of the scope that's necessary to establish the feasibility of a Canadian Northern Corridor. First up, we have Dr. Laz Manzur. She is a research associate with the Energy and Environmental Policy Research Division. Next, we have Dr. Katarina Koch, who's a postdoctoral research associate in the, Canadian, in the Northern Corridor Program in the Energy and Environment Department. And finally, we've got uh, a Kent Fellows, a research associate and associate program director in the School of Public Policy's Canadian Northern Quarter Research Program. Welcome, everyone. And Alaz, over to you. Thank you, Marcia. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today as we, um, as we start off the Canadian Northern Corridor webinar series. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, we will present a summary of the broad scope of the Canadian Northern Corridor concept and the School of Public Policy's Canadian Northern Corridor Research Program. Uh, joining me today in presenting our research programs also, um, Dr. Katerina Koch and Kent Fellows, who will be joining us in the Q&A part at the end. I should also mention that this is joint work with Kent Fellows, uh, Robert Mansell and PG First. And uh, if you cannot find all the answers to your questions about the Canadian Northern Corridor today, uh, please visit our website www.canadiancorridor.ca for information on the program's research collaborators and our past and current research. So let me, oh, sorry. Let me start with a, a brief description of the Canadian Northern Corridor concept. Canada's current infrastructure approach is um, quite piecemeal. Uh, projects are often uh, planned and implemented in isolation from one another, and regulatory and governance frameworks are specifically designed for individual projects and their specific purposes. The Canadian Northern Corridor concept arises from this need uh, for a long-term national strategy uh, and can be, pot can be a potential solution to Canada's geographic, political, legal, and economic challenges. The Canadian Northern Corridor concept um, is a network of pre-approved and administered rights of way through Canada's North and Near North, together with a regulatory and governance structure. It is important to note that the Canadian Northern Corridor is not an energy corridor. It is intend to be, intended to be multimodal, uh, capable of accommodating roads, rail, power lines, um, communication cables, commodity pipelines, and any further linear infrastructure modes. This map uh, here shows the notional corridor routing. Um, it is currently for, for illustrative purposes only, and the exact path will be determined as a result of the uh, as a result of future research uh, of our program. But the main idea here is that the Canadian Northern Corridor connects Canada from coast to coast to coast. Um, as you can see on the on the notional corridor route, it connects the Arctic with the existing southern infrastructure, west coast with Hudson Bay and Hudson Bay with Atlantic ports. So um, why are we interested in conducting this research and why is it important to assess the desirability and feasibility of a Canadian Northern Corridor? Um, Canada has benefited immensely from uh, major pan-Canadian infrastructure projects. Uh, these, are, these were mostly constructed in the 50s and 60s. They were critical in creating prosperity uh, by facilitating communication, transport, resource development and market access. However, um, while significant, significant constraints remain in the national infrastructure grid, the, the current piecemeal approach that I mentioned earlier translates into high costs and uncertainty. 
uh, these high costs and uncertainty direct major private investors to choose to go elsewhere, and they take along, uh, along with some potential associated benefits to all Canadians. So our research program on the corridor concept is developed in response to this need for, um, for a national infrastructure strategy. Canadian Northern Corridor Research Program um, is also a timely endeavor for us, um, as it appears that the post-pandemic social and economic recovery in Canada will um, heavily rely on infrastructure development if we consider the, the recent um, funding announcements from the Government of Canada. So let me briefly mention the potential benefits of the corridor concept for Canada. Uh, then we will explore each one of them in more detail. So we broadly categorize the potential benefits of the corridor concept across four topics. Um, the first one is improving economic outcomes. Um, the other one is streamlining economic protection in Canada's north, safeguarding indigenous agency, and finally promoting Canada's global and strategic significance. So let's start with the potential impact of the Northern Corridor on, on economic outcomes. One of the primary roles of the Northern Corridor uh, would be to serve as a bottleneck coordination mechanism. Uh, since it involves sufficient planning and analysis, corridor development would identify and mitigate systemic congestion and obstruction in the current infrastructure grid. Um, cur currently, Canada's transportation infrastructure does not represent a fully integrated system. This is mainly due to, um, as you know, Canada's geographical and economic characteristics, but of course, um, lack of planning and coordination in infrastructure development is also, is also important. This uncoordinated approach to interregional transportation infrastructure is flawed and limiting in many ways. Um, for example, consider the port of Metro Vancouver, uh, which, is a, which is an important route for Canada's international trade on the West Coast. But expansions of this port are very costly and face significant physical constraints due to the land management issues in lower, lower mainland BC. And this emphasizes the importance of effective and early planning for future infrastructure uh, that we want to um, take along. So corridor development will mean recognizing such limitations beforehand and prepare for them. Early planning can also identify infrastructure that is critical to the development of a region and can put the technical plans and environmental clearances in place beforehand. But this will enable infrastructure to be built rapidly when needed and in an ordered way. And in the long run, it will increase efficiency for the whole economy. And there's also the important impact um, of improving infrastructure, infrastructure network in Canada on international and uh, internal trade. So compared to other G7 nations, Canada currently ranks about average in terms of imports and exports as a share of its GDP. Um, but our domestic regional economies are heavily reliant on both internal and international trade. Um, improvements in infrastructure can lead to lower trade costs and improved gains from trade for all regions. And uh, as we know from previous research, reducing internal trade costs through Canada-wide Canada improvements in infrastructure can generate as much as $130 billion annually. And this is um, roughly equivalent to 7% uh, 7% increase in annual GDP for Canada. So it's a, it's a large sum. So to sum up, um, potential economic benefits would be wide ranging for Canada. Job and income creation, decreases in cost of living, uh, better accessibility to goods and services, and an implied overall uh, improvement to Canadians' well-being associated with higher real incomes. Um, the Northern Corridor can also uh, improve standards of low living in Canada's North and Near North, which is a significant challenge, which has been a significant challenge for Canada. Um, for example, Canada's Arctic and Northern Policy Framework um, issued in 2019 asserts that insufficient physical and social infrastructure has hindered opportunities for growth um, and prosperity in the region. So the federal government has responded this, to this need um, with the establishment of the Canada Infrastructure Bank in 2017. Um, Canada, uh, the CIB's mandate is to attract private and public investment uh, funding for infrastructure projects, but as highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, Canadian infrastructure is still insufficient in maintaining uninterrupted flow of goods and services and access to reliable and fast broadband internet, for example, particularly in the, in the rural northern areas and indigenous communities. 
Connectivity is a significant challenge in the north. Um, for example, in the Northwest Territories, only 69% of communities have um, 69% of communities have access to terrestrial communications connections, and the rest rely on slower and more expensive um, satellite uplinks. Another example is Nunavut, of course, where no community actually has access to terrestrial con telecommunications connections. So northern communities face particularly acute bottlenecks in movement of goods and services, and they rely largely on the seasonal winter roads that, that was that's built um, annually across the permafrost. But the season for permafrost, uh, sorry, the season for winter roads is um, becoming more and more unpredictable and shorter due to, due to climate change. Therefore, uh, depending on the specific needs of the communities, a reduction in infrastructure deficit would mean securing improved access to fundamentals like um, clean water, uh, food security, healthcare, education, and emergency management and response. These goods and services all require some combination of all-weather road access, um, high-speed internet connectivity, and reliable energy supply that the Northern Corridor, um, the Canadian Northern Corridor concept can provide. The current approach tends to focus on alleviating newly identified congestion rather than overcoming the entrenched regional disadvantages. Um, and sound analysis of these costs as being conducted here um, at the School of Public Policy helps primarily, primarily to overcome this infrastructure prioritization prejudice. Okay, now let's move on to the impact on, uh, potential impact on environmental protection. The corridor concept um, allows for multiple linear infrastructure projects to be located along a single right of way. Uh, compared to multiple one-off projects, this implies less land use disturbance, and when done correctly, it would reduce habitat fragmentation and allow for better cumulative effects management of the environment. The corridor would also um, allow for more centralized, integrated monitoring of infrastructure and its impact on the environment by um, enabling better data collection along the route, um, emergency response and adaptive management um, of the ecosystem in general. The corridor, um, would uh, provide an established pathway um, already rig rigorously assessed beforehand by the relevant regulatory authorities and trialed by the stakeholders. This would significantly reduce upfront regulatory burden on project proponents uh, without, without the adverse, uh, adverse impact on, on environmental standards. Um, so now Katharina will continue with the, with the potential role of the, of the corridor in safeguarding indigenous agency. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, a third very important aspect of the Northern Corridor and a key objective is the inclusion of indigenous communities and businesses, which we consider as important potential project proponents. At this stage, it is also important to re-emphasize that in the context of infrastructure development on indigenous territories, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis in Canada have unique rights that are guaranteed under Section 35 of the Constitution Act from 1982. And these were also reaffirmed in later Supreme Court judgments. However, infrastructure development has been quite notorious for failing the federal duty to consult. For example, the approval of the Trans Mountain Pipeline was delayed by nearly two years because the Federal Court of Appeal had, in 2018, ordered new rounds of consultation procedures with indigenous communities because previous consultations did not meet the constitutional standard. In addition to such challenges, there has also been a notable lack of transparency when private companies or public bodies communicate their project plans to indigenous communities. This lack of transparency can be addressed through an appropriate corridor governance model that safeguards indigenous rights and fosters an atmosphere of trust between indigenous communities, industry, and government representatives. The goal for the Canadian Northern Corridor is to go beyond the duty to consult and to focus on indigenous engagement and to establish an open and transparent dialogue. In this way, the corridor is an opportunity for inclusive growth and reconciliation. A fourth important aspect is to promote Canada's global and strategic significance. 
Canada has renewed its focus on its northern and Arctic regions, which is underlined by the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework that was published last year. The framework highlights particular aspects that are relevant for northern regions, such as the prominent north-south divide impacting trade flows, climate change and environmental transformation, as well as the geostrategic potential of Canada's northern untapped natural resources. We argue that underdeveloped infrastructure in the Northern Arctic pose a risk to Canada's sovereignty because multiple countries assert their territorial and strategic interests in the Arctic, particularly the US, Russia, and China. The current underdeveloped state of infrastructure in the Canadian North significantly impedes Canada's ability to consolidate its Arctic territorial claims, for example, over the Northwest Passage, especially when taking into account the aspirations of other states, most notably Russia and China. China's economic and political involvement in the Arctic has increased substantially throughout the last decade as Chinese investors become more involved in economic projects across Arctic regions. In comparison, Canada has been lagging behind in terms of infrastructure development in its own Arctic regions. For example, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper had proposed a deep water port and military refueling station in Nunavut in 2007 to be completed in 2013. But just this year, it was reported that there, were, there would be now even further construction delays due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The development of a Canadian Northern Corridor would be a significant factor in consolidating Canada's continued presence in the Arctic from both a commercial and security perspective. What we are currently observing is an increased global interest in large-scale national and international multimodal infrastructure corridors. The most notable example that many of you might know would be the China's Road and Belt Initiative, which is sometimes called the New Silk Road and represents a global infrastructure development strategy adopted by the Chinese government in 2013 to invest in foreign countries and international organizations. In Canada, we also have significant large-scale and pan-Canadian infrastructure corridor, corridors. The most notable ones are, as many of you know, the Trans-Canada Highway, officially opened in 1962, or the Trans-Canada Main Line, constructed in the 1950s to facilitate interprovincial trade of natural gas across Canada, along with access to U.S. markets. However, what these examples show is that since the late 1960s, there has not been or only very little government interest in large-scale and pan-Canadian infrastructure projects. Yet, international commercial interest in Canada's north underlines the significance of a Canadian Northern Corridor as a national pan-Canadian infrastructure strategy to ensure Canada's global competitiveness and position as a major actor in the Arctic. Without comprehensive and integrated planning, the future of Canada's North and Near North is at risk of following the pattern of the last five decades, a lack of project certainty and continued proposals for one-off investments resulting in a piecemeal approach to infrastructure development. What we have experienced in Canada are delays that stem from inadequate procedures to satisfy the constitutional duty to consult with indigenous communities and environmental impact assessment. The Canadian Northern Corridor offers an opportunity with extensive research and groundwork to establish a pre-approved infrastructure rights of way in which individual projects can hit the ground running with the confidence that major consultation and impact assessment procedures have already been carried out. As I last had already mentioned in the beginning, it is important to underline that the School of Public Policy is not proposing to build the infrastructure, but conducting the research on the potential of a Canadian Northern Corridor and to establish its feasibility, desirability, and the most suitable choice for its implementation. For this, we are adopting a strategy based on peer-reviewed academic study, coupled with formal engagement with indigenous communities, businesses and governments, which will in turn also inform our own research results. We also have developed an, an accompanying dissemination strategy to reach as many interested parties as possible and across a wide spectrum, from academics to policymakers, indigenous communities to private stakeholders. 
You can also see that our research program is extremely interdisciplinary. Our research includes a large variety of scientific inquiries related to trade, funding and financing, legal and regulatory questions, governance, geography and engineering, economics, social benefits and costs, as well as the environmental impact. While our research team conducts a number of studies related to these topics, we also invite external academics and experts to contribute with their knowledge and expertise on these topics. We wish to thank you all for your attention and for your participation. Please visit our website www.canadiancorridor.ca to learn more about our research contributors and further information on the research program. And we are now looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Katerina. Uh, thanks, Alaz. That was terrific. Uh, and as I look at it, we've got a lot of great questions rolling in. So I'll do my best to just put them out to the panel and uh, you folks can, can answer uh, at will. So let me start with a couple of, of technical questions uh, because I think folks have a couple questions about just how exactly this thing could work. So I think in your remarks, you talked about the corridor providing a pre-approved uh, uh, corridor for projects, uh, private sector projects in order to be able to use them. And the question is, what does pre-approved mean? Who, who approves it? And is there currently um, any pre-existing right of ways that could be accessed? I guess I'll, I'll jump in uh, uh, here in quiet from uh, from the two presenters. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think it, it, the key point is not to get too bogged down in the language of pre-approval. Um, when we think of these large linear infrastructure projects, pipelines, rail lines, even highways, if they're new highways, there is an awful lot of, of we refer to it as regulatory underbrush. This idea that you have to get all your ducks in a row and there are a lot of ducks to get in a row. So when we say pre-approval, what we're really talking about in the context of the corridor is trying to get as many of those ducks in a row as possible and, and sort of sharing that organization between multiple modes. So this would be stuff like, um, part of your environmental impact assessment. If the survey work is done for you and you know the water crossings in the area, that lowers a lot of the burden for a, for a, a private project proponent. Um, land rights issues, so making sure that you have secured right to construct. Um, and that might vary mode to mode. You can think of, you know, a, a, a land right holder might have less of an issue with, say, a rail line than a pipeline or vice versa. So pre-approval or pre-clearance here, uh, more or less, is just referring to as much of this, this groundwork as we can get done as possible, setting it up so that within a corridor we have some strategy where the infrastructure is going to go and getting as much of that regulation out of the way as possible, particularly the stuff that would apply to more than one mode of transportation. Um, so Alaz, I saw you nodding. Do you have anything to add there? No, nope. okay. Okay, now I'll move to the bigger picture. What would you say to critics that would say, uh, or contend, I guess, that we have really seen the end of national projects, that the current regulatory and political environment really precludes any kind of national project of this kind of scale from occurring. What, what would you say to those folks? I can jump in. Um, I'm not sure about the political climate, by, but um, economically it makes better sense to actually um, choose this approach to build, a, build, a, build corridors right now, rather than building uh, individual individual pieces of infrastructure whenever they are needed because it's more costly. It's costlier and also it's more time consuming. Um, although the, the initial research required to build a corridor is uh, probably will take longer um, than the, the individual infrastructure projects. In the long run, it's more efficient. Um, it is more economical. And it is also, if I, I'm not, if I'm wrong, Katerina can correct me, but uh, strategically what Canada needs right now, especially in the north and near north. Thank you. Yeah, I can I, I can add something to that. That also what we are seeing currently, and also when we already think ahead into a post-COVID world, 
the federal government has released this $10 billion in infrastructure investment through the Canada Infrastructure Bank. So the interest in infrastructure development is definitely there. Now, the question is, what is the most efficient way to do it? And what we are proposing is this corridor rights of way. And this also has the idea that it disturbs the environment in the north as little as possible in comparison to, let's say, one-off projects that are being done currently in this piecemeal approach between, let's say, two territories or provinces or individual projects. So we are more having this encompassing strategy. Great, thank you. Well, speaking of the timeline, uh, I mean, it's it's clear this project is going to take, you know, some time as as projects of this size and nature often do. It's going to take some time to put together. So, what would be the what would you say would be the impact of the current um, environment of depressed oil prices? You know, we're seeing forecasts of declining oil demand by at least by 2050. Some are saying by 2030. Um, and of course, in Alberta, our, our major interest in this uh, project is from a from a transportation of oil and oil products perspective. So, what do you think this? You know, juxtaposing kind of the long term uh, time requirements of the corridor and then you know, this environment where we're seeing uh, depressed prices, where are the benefits there for Alberta? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I mean, I, I, this goes to sort of the old joke that the best time to do this would have been the 1960s. The second best time is probably now. Um, and I think it's really important and particularly for people sitting in Alberta um, to get our heads around the fact that transportation isn't just an energy sector issue. Um, you know, we, we see it more acutely here in Alberta right now because we have had this string of pipeline proposals that have been stalled and canceled and taken time to get into market. We've, we've lost a decade on some of these uh, where we could have been earning returns on that infrastructure and we haven't been. Um, but thinking towards the future, uh, whether it's oil and gas or another industry, you know, what else are we going to do in Western Canada? What else are we going to do in Eastern Canada? pretty well every industry that Canada is likely to have a comparative advantage in is going to require good transportation infrastructure. And, and going back, thinking wider than pipelines, one of my favorite anecdotes from all of this research is it is easier for the oil sands to get uh, large oversized uh, pieces of equipment from the U.S. market, in particular because we have oversized transportation corridors from Alberta down into the States. So if you're ordering a large oil sands vessel, you get it done in the States because you can get it here. The manufacturing industry in Ontario is very capable of producing them, but to get some of those large pieces of equipment from say Ontario to Alberta, they've got to go down into the States anyway. So you're paying extra on transportation. So really this is about making every single sector in the Canadian economy more efficient uh, because we'll be able to actually move goods between the provinces and between Canada inter and, in and international markets. Great, thanks, Kent. Well, speaking of moving things between the provinces, I mean, uh, there has been traditionally, uh, you know, many political barriers to provincial and interprovincial trade, and certainly we've seen lots of examples of, you know, really challenging relationships between provinces on things like electricity. You know, the worst example I can think of is between Newfoundland and Quebec on uh, Churchill Falls. And so I guess the question is, um, what do you think is required in order to get the level of cooperation that this kind of a project would need uh, between provinces? I mean, I don't really... Uh... No, but political processes that would be required, but and the challenges that they will be faced that they will be facing. But um, once the economics is there, I think once the rigorous analysis is there, if it's um, good for everyone, if it's good for all Canadians' well-being, um, why not? And how can you how can you object that if it's, if the research is there? That's how we are trying to contribute. Katarina, do you want to jump in a little bit on the uh, on the governance side of things? Because I know you, you've been working on a paper that's coming out soon in that area. Yeah, so what we have been looking at is a potential governance framework. And we are aware that the lead of this project, let's say of, of a governance framework for the Northern Corridor, 
the best option would be that it would be supported by the federal government as the pan-Canadian kind of an, an endorsement from the Canadian government. But what we are always really emphasizing is this strong cooperation between provinces be with private stakeholders, indigenous communities to really bring all these actors on the table. And it might even be impossible to really find a consensus, but at least to work towards an agreement on certain issues because yeah, with all this, with the, all these different actors on the table, consensus reaching is the most challenging aspect of this project, uh, also, I would say. Well, Karina, uh, Katerina, you talked a bit there about uh, the role for Indigenous peoples in supporting this work. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the level of engagement that uh, you have had or the project has had with Indigenous people on the research? So we are working currently on our um, Indigenous engagement strategy. Uh, we are currently starting the process because yeah, our project is also still, the, the research is really just starting now. We are coming out with the framing studies to set the ground. And now we are basically going into the field, let's say, and um, to, talk, to start talking and to identifying, to identify the interest that is actually there, like who is actually interested who is interested in talking with us. Um, so we are currently still developing our engagement strategy. Um, I know many people are hinting also towards this, but COVID-19 has also slightly put us behind in, in this regard, um, but we will, we will hit the ground running now during this fall and then during the next year to further engage with indigenous communities. Great, thank you. Now, one question relates to kind of our historical experience. So in the early 80s, Petro-Canada, as it was then named, uh, conducted an environmental study uh, titled the Baffin Island Oil Spill Study, right? So a, a study uh, talking about the environmental impacts of uh, the oil spills. So would you see that a northern quarter uh, would include moving energy supply through the, the high Arctic navigable waters and could solidification of crude oil into pellets, you know, solve some of the spillage concerns? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question um, and a difficult one to speculate on right now because there are so many other related policies with Arctic shipping for oil and gas. Um, I mean, I think uh, talking specifically about sort of bitumen pellets or bitumen pucks, one thing that's necessary to move those is, yeah, you don't need a pipeline, but you still need rail lines. So depending on where you're picking them up and dropping them off, that may mean new infrastructure there as well. Uh, in terms of the Arctic coast, I mean, I certainly think we see linkages to new ports on the Arctic coast, whether those become something that uh, gets used for shipping oil and gas, that's much longer term speculation. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out. But there, uh, like you said, there's a lot that you need to do to make sure that you've got your safety standards in place. And that's something where, uh, you know, we talked earlier about the pre-clearance. That's something that you certainly probably couldn't have uh, pre-clearance for because it's something that you're going to have to look at more specifically uh, in terms of risk assessment to uh, local ecosystems. So a big question, probably not a satisfactory answer, but it's sort of the one we have right now. Uh, you bet. You bet. Well, maybe I'll ask just another mapping question because you can't help but think about the map and, and look at the map when you think about the corridor initiative. So one uh, of our audience members asks why we don't show the connection outside Canada. You know, why doesn't this route include a connection to Alaska, you know, in particular to Valdez or Anchorage, you know, why would the Western part at least not particularly follow the Alaska highway? So some interest in Alaska there. Well, I think uh, it is important to emphasize that this is a notional route. So it's, we haven't done yet the research on the feasibility of, let's say, the specific regions through which such a corridor yeah, could be feasible or even desired by, let's say, also the indigenous communities that would be located along the route. So what we are having on the map is right now a concept 
Like this is what really needs to be highlighted. This is a concept. We are still doing conducting the research on engineering, the engineering issues. Um, also, there's a lot of environmental transformations going on that needs to be taken into account because that could also put infrastructure in the future at risk, um, especially when we think in terms of permafrost, for example. So um, there's absolutely no reason that we haven't like that we haven't built put this connection with Alaska because this could be also a potential routing. But just for to for us to work with this concept, we have developed this map for now and the route will still further develop as we go along in our research. Great. Thank you. Now here, here's a, a, a bit of a different direction. Um, a couple of questions related to the impact of the corridor on Canadian sovereignty. So I, I know part of the rationale for the corridor is that it uh, actually asserts Canadian sovereignty in the north in ways that uh, we haven't in the past. Um, and I think uh, that the, the questioner is asking, why aren't we doing, why isn't school doing more uh, analysis on that particular aspect of the, uh, of the corridor, how it impacts uh, Canadian sovereignty? And I guess in particular, are we looking for any connections to uh, kind of military objectives uh, with, uh, uh, with the project? Um, well, I can say to that, we are conducting studies into the corridor concept and its impact on Canadian Arctic, Northern sovereignty and security, and also how it would influence Canada's global position. So not, so also in relation to, I mean, the first states that many people might think of is Canada's relation with um, China and Russia, right? Because right now we are talking about a triad of states that are more or less also determining a lot of the geopolitical situation of what is happening in the Arctic. Those are the US, Russia, and China. So one very reasonable question is to ask, where is Canada in this scenario. And this is exactly what we are also studying with uh, in the context of the Northern Corridor. Great, thank you. Um, speaking about the North, uh, uh, we certainly talked a little bit about the engagement plans that you're developing with Indigenous groups. Uh, one of our audience members is asking how we are engaging directly with people, uh, non-Indigenous people in the North, uh, other interests uh, that could be represented because too often I think these projects are conceived of by people in the south and landed on people in the north without sufficient, you know, engagement or buy-in or, or, or co-development. So, what are the plans for engaging uh, the north? Yeah, I can I can talk about that. Um, I mean, I, first and foremost, we've been fairly active going back even so far as 2016 in uh, some of the northern trade conferences. Um, so, you know, members of the team have presented this research or, or earlier versions of it um, before we, we built quite as much momentum as we have now at those annual trade conferences. Uh, we also have a, uh, an external advisory committee for the program. Um, and I, I, I mean, I don't want to pick out specific names uh, on that, but we do have representatives from the government of Northwest Territories. We've got industry representatives. We've got uh, Indigenous Investment Corporation representatives. So we really are trying to make sure that uh, that we have those interests uh, involved early. So they're not just sort of reviewing uh, research. They're help helping us set the direction of the research. Uh, and it's a great time to have uh, more people like that involved because we're currently at the stage where the questions are multiplying a little bit faster than the answers, which is great as a researcher. Uh, but in terms of coming to conclusions, uh, you know, that's why it is a multi-year program and, and, and one that, uh, that we're envisioning you know, several dozen different papers in different areas on. Great. Oh, well, speaking of one of your other papers, I mean, could you talk a little bit about the climate impacts, uh, sort of both positive and negative of pursuing this kind of project? I have several questions uh, in the line that talk about you know, we've talked about some of the climate benefits, but are there uh, negative climate impacts from this kind of a, of a project? Maybe I can, um, I can mention that a bit. So we have um, an upcoming uh, thing, uh, study uh, under 
going. It's, it's still in the planning stage, but we will definitely have um, some studies on the species at risk in the north, area, protected areas in the north and near north. So the, any kind of infrastructure project is a disturbance to the environment, of course. But um, our purpose is to determine if this concept is feasible um, for Canada. If, if it is feasible, what is the best way of doing it, um, mo mo the most sensible way of doing it in terms of its environmental impact as well. So uh, we are not only looking at the best economic outcome for all Canadians, but also trying to find the optimal route that would minimize the, the um, environment and environmental impact. So one benefit of, um, or one advantage of the corridor concept over using um, individual projects or, or, or rather than developing individual projects in the north is that um, that centralized integrated monitoring um, of, a, of, of the whole, whole corridor. Um, and like having the pathway established beforehand, um, which is vigorously assessed um, by all stakeholders and regulatory authorities, um, which also reduces the burden and also um, a significant portion of the adverse impact on uh, on the environment. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. Again, we had lots of questions uh, related to politics and the political environment because, of course, that's had significant impacts on some of the projects we here in Alberta uh, have been advancing. Um, one of the questions is related to broadband, right? So you see, the federal government recently made an announcement to improve broadband across the country. And this is absolutely critical for you know, rural and remote communities, communities in the North. Uh, how do you see the corridor and does the corridor support that kind of an initiative? Um, I can jump in or uh, our broadband ex export can jump in. <laughs> no, it definitely does. I was just going to say it definitely does. Um, um, and it's, it's an important aspect. The connectivity issue is an important aspect of the corridor research in general. Great. Uh, one of the questions relates to how this project is advancing. So um, you know, there, there's a question about whether the School of Public Policy is engaging with other policy schools across the country or in other regions to help uh, flesh out the concept further and potentially build better support and understanding. Yeah, I can, I can jump in on that. Um, so, I mean, right now, in terms of the papers uh, that we're commissioning, we're trying to find individual authors. So that's not necessarily a partnership with another policy school or with another department, but looking for outstanding people in various fields, uh, you know, cold weather engineering uh, or, or highway building over uh, permafrost, uh, environmental and climate change issues in, in the North and near North in Canada. So we've been seeking out specific researchers for that. But the School of Public Policy does have a longstanding uh, uh, agreement partnership with Serrano, which is uh, um, an organization of several uh, university departments uh, out of uh, Quebec. Uh, on this, uh, the the initial papers we did on the Northern Corridor back in 2016 uh, were partnerships with Serrano, and and we've kept uh, we've kept that line of communication open. We're very active in terms of knowledge exchange in both directions there. So that's a formal partnership we have with sort of another university organization. Beyond that, it is uh, independent individual scholars uh, that we have working in papers in different areas. Um, we're certainly always open to chatting, uh, but for us, getting the research done is probably primarily the, the more important thing. Um, we're really careful. We're not. Uh, we're not project advocates. Um, you know, the the point of. of public consultation and, and, and public engagement right now is really to get people interested in the idea that, that it might be a reasonable way to go. Um, but in, in our own research, we are trying to be dispassionate here and adjudicating, you know, is there an economic case? How do you overcome so the environmental barriers? How do you deal with governance? Um, so far, the research has been promising. This looks like a good idea, which is why we're continuing to research it. Um, but we're not in the business of, of trying to convince uh, project proponents, hey, come and build in Canada. We are just doing the research to try to figure out what's the best way to encourage um, this kind of infrastructure uh, development. Great. Uh, another question relates to engagement with uh, private sector partners and, and potential proponents. Uh, in order for any kind of, of corridor to be successful, you obviously need uh, private sector partners in order to um, 
you know, you know, kind of take up the opportunity. Uh, what feedback have you had from any private sector proponents that have uh, previously built infrastructure of this nature? And that the examples I'm thinking are pipeline companies, electricity companies, uh, uh, railways, that type of thing. I mean, in, in general, uh, and, and sorry to keep monopolizing the mic, I've just been around a little bit longer than the other two. Um, in general, we've had positive responses. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a pretty constant fixture at some of these industry conferences. Um, and we get good questions, difficult questions, but in general, it's all positive. Um, industry wants this process to be easier, no surprise. Uh, so the key is trying to balance that against the, the regulatory requirements that we should have in place. It's easy to forget that the regulations exist for a reason. Um, and that reason is not just there to, to stifle investment. Uh, you know, there are protections that need to be in place and all this stuff. So it is a balancing act. But in general, the responses we've had, uh, particularly from, you know, consulting engineering uh, um, groups, um, individual sort of, you know, the pipeline industry, uh, even rail tends to be optimistic and positive, if a little bit cautious, because, uh, you know, they don't know if this is going to go anywhere either. Um, so we are getting positive feedback here. There hasn't been a whole lot of two way dialogue in terms of, of learning from each other yet. We hope that as the research gets further along, we'll get feedback on that that will help scope out even additional rounds of research um but right now we've had very little dissent on you know this is you guys are wasting your time go away most of it is this sounds like an interesting idea it sounded like an interesting idea when we heard about it in the late 60s early 70s hopefully you guys can make more hay out of it than uh, than we have in the past and and we think we can with this academic approach and and really making sure that we're concentrating on peer-reviewed high quality research and and playing an informative role rather than an advocacy role you bet. Uh, one question is just with respect to uh, the sectors that are covered or could be connected to the corridor. So we've talked about electricity, rail, broadband, uh, oil, gas pipelines. Um, I'm, I'm probably missing some others. But one question goes to uh, mining. You know, is there an opportunity for mining that is either close to the corridor or, or connected somehow to this initiative? Um, it definitely does. Um, currently, actually, we are uh, in the process of preparing a map of um, like a um, large map, map with all the mining operations going on in the north, uh, near north um, discovered sources. And uh, But it's not only mining, it's not only resource sector, it is also about tourism industry, for example, it is also um, it is actually through the supply chain, like all, uh, the, the, all the industries along the, along the kind of the supply chain, um, all, all across the provinces and territories are in some way included in the, in the analysis of the currently known quarter concept. Great, thank you. Uh, another question goes to markets. So a, a really important underpinning to the quarter concept is that uh, it has tremendous economic benefits, certainly from connectivity across our own country, but also connectivity to uh, foreign markets. Are you doing any analysis of uh, the types of markets uh, in terms of uh, you know, the economic analysis that you're doing? Are we considering uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, you know, China. So what's the market analysis that's uh, being done? Um, I think that the earlier um, research done touched that issue a bit before, uh, but we are also in the process of commissioning uh, um, another, another paper on the possible impact on the Canada's international trade in the, in the longer term. Um, and that would definitely include possibilities of new ports, um, port expansions, capacity expansions along the routes, um, main uh, in the south, also in the north. Um, so that's definitely currently being con uh, considered and analyzed. Uh, yeah, it's, an, it's a very important issue. I think one additional point I'll have there is, you know, if you think about Canada over the last sort of 10, 15 years, 
the federal government has put a lot of effort into trade agreements outside of our traditional trading partner, the U.S. I mean, we put a lot of a lot of effort into a new NAFTA as well. Uh, that wasn't necessarily on purpose. That was more of a reaction to U.S. policy. Uh, but thinking about other markets, uh, you know, there's the the Canada uh, U, U, or EU uh, free trade agreement. Uh, there's also the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We spent a lot of time thinking about Europe as a market and Asia as a market. Uh, that's great. And having those trade agreements in place is fantastic. But the trade agreements are worth a whole lot more if we can move the goods at lower costs. You know, if you if you can't move a good to a market or if it costs too much to move a good to a market, the trade agreement really isn't worth that much because it doesn't matter whether there's a tariff there or not. Um, to, to make it worth something, getting rid of those tariffs and, and getting those trade agreements in place, we really need to think about how do we move goods from, say, a market in um, Winnipeg to a market in Europe or a market in Western Ontario to a market in China, right? And, and that means thinking about both of our overland transportation strategy, so rail to the coasts or highway to the coasts, as well as port infrastructure, uh, actually getting access to that tidewater as well. A couple of questions here about the interest of northern governments in this initiative. Uh, in particular, we under you know we know there's a huge infrastructure gap uh, with respect to Nunavut, and uh, I know I think I think I know that the Northwest Territories government of Northwest Territories was an early sponsor of the work, but are you getting um, interest and support from some of the northern governments uh, in the con in this concept? I guess I'm probably best positioned to jump in on that one as well. Um, yeah, we, we do have direct engagement uh, with the government of Northwest Territories. Uh, we have conversations back and forth there um, semi-frequently. And as I mentioned, they have someone on the external advisory committee, uh, which is wonderful. Um, we, we get positive responses uh, from from Nunavut um, and, and the Yukon Territory as well. Um, the relationship there isn't quite as formal in terms of you know them having someone on our external advisory committee, um, but they are positive conversations. Uh, yeah, um, I certainly don't want to speak for the for for either any of those governments, so I probably won't go a whole lot further in commenting than that. Just say from from our perspective at the school, uh, the engagement with the territorial governments has been fantastic. Uh, you know, we get lots of useful information from them, both in terms of directing us to research resources, helping us figure out what questions we should ask, and generally being supportive of the research in the concept, if not necessarily the concept, uh, although I suspect that will come at some point as well. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, I think the last question I think that we'll probably have time for, and I, I would probably ask each of you to, to respond to this one because I think it's a, a broad, uh, all encompassing question. And that is that uh, Canada has had long time, big ambitions for the North, uh, particularly, you know, the Arctic all across the North and near North. And yet we have struggled uh, to realize those ambitions um, in any number of projects and initiatives that have been proposed. So what do you think is different now, if anything, or what would be required in order to, um, I guess, bring together the support that would be needed in order to really uh, make an initiative of this kind a success now in the modern you know, regulatory and legislative environment that we currently have? Yeah, I can say, I can start. So from my perspective, and I'm coming from, from Germany, and the EU is this huge integrated system. And when I came to Canada, I was quite surprised how disintegrated some of the policy domains are. So I think what the Canadian Corridor tries to do is really bring Canada kind of closer together from different policy perspectives and through infrastructure. So what is definitely required, as I had already also said earlier, is really this cooperation and collaboration and to try to identify all the relevant stakeholders and rights holders that, that might be interested or, or also have opposing opinions, right? Because we are not discarding also uh, voices of dissent because they are also informing our our research. So cooperation and collaboration is key from my point of view. Great. Great. I guess I actually I do have time for one more question if I can. And that is uh, a connection with this uh, 
corridor concept to other initiatives that are underway. For example, uh, the Alaska Railway Development, you know, the, the Alberta to Alaska Railway uh, Initiative, and that, that's been discussed for a while, but has recently, I think, received some support from the Alberta government. Um, are we talking to and connected to those kinds of initiatives? Yeah, so uh, I mean, we're we're always open to those conversations, um, and you know, for for any proposal that you point to, there's a good chance that we've had some conversation with the project proponents. Um, how detailed that is depends on the project, um, but I think for us, and this goes back to the earlier question as well, one of the things that uh, that I, I think is really important to the success of the research here is that we are academic, dispassionate, and we're not tied to a specific project. Um, you know, one of the things that's that's great for the school um, and good for the research is we don't really have a horse in the race, if that makes sense. Um, you know, there's no big financial windfall for the University of Calgary if this project goes ahead, if we do end up with a Canadian quarter, uh, and we don't lose out necessarily if, if we don't have one. Um, so, you know, the interest and, and the advocacy for the idea that, that we end up with um, is I think an honest one and not necessarily brought forth by a, a particular financial interest or something like that. Um, you know, poll after poll after poll shows that in terms of public trust, universities and academic research, while not necessarily as respected as it has been say 20 years ago, still comes out as number one. And so that's why it's really important for us uh, that this be an academic study. Uh, I know Robert Mansell, who's one of the co-authors on this report, sort of refers to it as our own royal commission, not something that, that has um, specific uh, a government mandate, oh, but uh, um, something that uh, that is led that way. And I have a barking dog, so I'm going to finish up pretty quickly here, sorry. Um, but I think for us, that is why it's really important. That's what makes it different from other proposals is that it is academic in nature. It's coming out of a university. Sorry about that. Great. Thanks for that, Ken. And it wouldn't be a Zoom conference unless we had a barking dog or a baby, you know, a toddler running in or some other kind of excitement. Uh, so I think, uh, folks, it's just been a fantastic uh, conversation this morning. I think that it's an, been an excellent primer uh, for the, the webinars that are to come. I want to thank you, Alaz, Katerina, and Kent for um, your presentation, as well as some of your candid remarks and responding to the questions from the audience. Uh, I wanna thank the audience for joining us today because I, we've had some excellent questions and really good engagement. And I do wanna remind people that uh, we have another webinar scheduled for next Thursday, November 19th, focusing on how we tackle climate change and how that connects to the feasibility of the Canadian Northern Quarter. So thank you everyone for joining us today and have a good afternoon. Bye now.